We begin on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as we now hear a word from sacred scripture. The Lord God said, It isn't good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And then the man said, 
This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from the letter to the Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to the ancestors in many ways and in various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he also created the world. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere. What are human beings that we, you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels, and you have crowned them with glory and with honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might test death, taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. 
I will praise you. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then, in the house... The disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Amen. Amen. Today's gospel passage often makes people nervous, some people nervous. It makes preachers nervous, that's for sure. Because Jesus speaks directly and specifically about a painful subject. Divorce. Jesus condemns divorce. But we have to evaluate the words of our Lord in their proper context. Jesus very well may condemn divorce, but Jesus does not condemn those who are divorced. Jesus is the one who was gentle with the Samaritan woman at the well, who had been married five times and was at that time living with a man out of wedlock. He did not condemn her. Instead, he offered her the living water that would quench her thirst, the thirst that she had for peace and for love. Jesus is the one who persuaded the purveyors of capital punishment to drop their stones 
and asked the woman caught in adultery who was moments away from death, is there no one here to condemn you? No one, sir, she replied. Then neither do I. Go and sin no more. When we put those actions of Jesus in context, we can say with confidence that Jesus condemns divorce, but he does not condemn those who are divorced. In speaking about divorce today, Jesus is really speaking more directly about marriage. Concern over divorce isn't new to our generation. In Jesus' time, the Pharisees, those who were strict scholars of the law, were divided over Moses' intention regarding the allowance of divorce. Followers of Rabbi Shami believed that divorce was only allowed in the case of a wife's infidelity. A wife's infidelity. Followers of Rabbi Hillel, however, held a looser interpretation of divorce so that If the wife burned her husband's dinner, he could put her out of the house. That is, divorce her. Better be a good cook. (laughs) Marriage. Marriage. (laughs) Marriage was more of a contract than a covenant. It may be helpful to consider how a contract is quite different from a covenant, especially that God enters into covenants with us, with his people. God enters into covenants, not contracts. The Pharisees approach Jesus to test him by asking whether divorce is lawful or not. Jesus' response should be our response as Christians. Our conversation needs to shift from the permissibility of divorce to the permanence of marriage. We spend lots of time and energy trying to justify divorce and... There are certain occasions when divorce is necessary, and there are times when divorce is the choice of only one person, leaving the other with no option. When I was a newly ordained priest, I had a funeral for a man with two obituaries in the newspaper. One obituary from his legitimate family, survived by his wife of 50 years and their four children, and the other obituary from his illegitimate family, survived by his longtime companion of 45 years and their two children. Now, when Jesus condemns divorce, is our Lord suggesting that such a situation, that is, retaining the wedding vows for 50 years while maintaining a separate household and family for 45 years, that that is holy and permissible just because he didn't divorce the one he married first? Of course, that is not what Jesus is saying. Jesus' response to the Pharisees points back to the beginning of creation, the time before the fall, the time before sin entered the equation. The union of Adam and Eve represented something permanent and pure and holy. Sin. Sin ruptured that permanence, that purity, and that holiness. Jesus says that the reason Moses permitted divorce in the book of Deuteronomy is because of the hardness of heart and infidelity of the people. Moses permitted divorce because allowing them to divorce was better than turning a blind eye to the sin and decay of infidelity. Infidelity to God and infidelity to one another. Divorce is caused by hardness of heart. Sometimes by one person, sometimes by both. Today's gospel concludes with people bringing children to Jesus. And the disciples try to shoo them away. But Jesus recognizes the innocence of the little ones and asks that they be allowed to come to him, declaring that unless we receive the kingdom of God with such innocence and humility, we will never inherit the kingdom Jesus, who had just laid out the teaching on divorce, knows that children don't grow up dreaming of divorce. In their innocence and in their purity, children grow up believing and embracing the ideal, wanting the ideal, 
dreaming of being perhaps in a lifelong loving marriage forever and ever. But children grow up into adults. And adults can be self-centered and mean and spiteful and passive-aggressive and abusive and addicted and a whole host of other things that necessitate the dissolution of a marriage. But if we were to remain innocent like children or at least strive to return to that innocence, then perhaps marriage has a chance. Embracing that holy innocence can bring a marriage back from the brink of divorce and even survive infidelities and problems if sincere contrition, forgiveness, and purity is chosen over selfish, <laughs> selfish sinfulness. Last week in the gospel, we heard Jesus say that if our hand causes us to sin, cut it off. Or that if our foot causes us to sin, cut it off. Or if our eye causes us to sin, to gouge it out. And for some, remaining in an abusive marriage, a marriage that draws us away from God rather than towards God, necessitates that the marriage be amputated or, ga or, or gouged out. But that's not the ideal. We've all been touched in some way by divorce either for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, our family, our friends. We've all been touched in some way by divorce. We can spend our time trying to justify divorce, trying to excuse divorce, or trying to ignore divorce. What Jesus is challenging the Pharisees and us to do is to not look at divorce as much as we are to look at marriage. According to the book of Genesis and as quoted by Jesus, we hear that marriage is not a human invention but was instituted by God. A truly pure, holy marriage cannot be undone by human beings. Does this mean that those who don't divorce are in perfect marriages? No. Does this mean that those who remain faithful to each other don't encounter difficulties, trials, or errors? No. Does this mean that those who embrace the holiness of marriage, taking their children to church every Sunday, that their children will be perfect? Or that their children won't do drugs or end up in jail or drop out of school or stop going to church or even get divorced themselves? No. But what, it, what this means is that marriage is to be a reflection unto the world of God's faithfulness. In reality, marriage is to be a reflection of God's very nature. In the Genesis story, the woman is made from the substance of the man. The man and woman are of the same substance. In our creed, we pray that Jesus is begotten of the Father, begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. And what we mean by this is that Jesus is made of the same God stuff as the Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are unified in their substance. Similarly, Husband and wife are joined in marriage so that the substance of who they are is no longer one person wandering in the world, but is now two joined into unity so that together, together they move in the same direction. They set the same goals. They support and guide one another. They see their end in God as one. Married couples unified in substance are a reflection of the Trinity. As Christians, it's time for us to shift the focus of our conversation about whether or not our divorce or their divorce or your divorce is justified or not. Let's instead talk about how our marriage, their marriage, your marriage reflects the time before sin entered the world, 
how marriage is a gift from God, how grace flows into the world through married couples. Let's learn and then teach what we hear at weddings in the Episcopal Church when the presider says in the opening welcome, marriage, marriage signifies to us the mystery of the union between Christ and his church. And Holy Scripture commends it to be honored among all people. Amen. Regardless of our vocation in life, whether it's to marriage or to the single life or some vocational profession, we are all called to reflect the love and the unity of the Trinity. So let us turn to page 358, stand and proclaim what it is that we believe about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, born of being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. prayer to page 387 for the prayers of the people form three page 387 let us pray for Christ's church and the world father we pray for your holy catholic church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. 
May we also come to share with our heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We ask, O oh Lord, that you care for our brothers and sisters who are in need of shelter as the weather turns cold and damp. We ask that you offer them the protection and the sustenance that they need. May we be your hands and feet to help provide some of their, for some of their needs. I ask for your prayers for the family of Gordon Reynolds Jr., a classmate of Allison and I who passed away this past week as they grieve and mourn his unexpected and untimely death. And that we pray for all those who grieve On the gold bookmark, let us now pray together for the election of a bishop. Almighty, Almighty God, God, giver, giver of, of every good gift, gift, look graciously on your church, on all those who are discerning a potential call, and on the people of God in this diocese, and so guide the minds and hearts of those who shall choose the eleventh bishop of the Diocese of South Dakota that we may receive a faithful pastor who will care for our people and equip us for our ministries through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Turning back to page 360, let us confess, let us confess our sins and infidelities against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. service, we will have a welcome reception in our parish hall for all people uh, to be with us so that we may have some coffee and treats, um, spend a little time with one another, ask how each other's week is going, and offer prayers for the coming week. I think it would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge something that I think is important that we recognize together. Um, the Episcopal Church has a sign out front that says, the Episcopal Church welcomes you. And when we say we welcome all, we welcome all. And I want to thank Richard Jones, and I want to thank Dwight Edstrom for the gentle way in which you handled our friend. Thank you so much. We do want to be a welcoming congregation, but in this time and in this era and this day and age, safety must come first. And if any of us feels unsafe, then we have to address it. Thank you for caring for this gentleman in such a gentle way, Richard and Dwight. 
thank you all for sharing, um, allowing him the dignity that he deserves as a human being. He is someone who comes to our office frequently, so I'm familiar with him. So I wasn't nervous or upset by his mannerisms and his, his outbursts, but I know that it can be a little unsettling, again, in this day and age. Um, again, when we address such situations with our brothers and sisters, that we do it with gentleness and love. And you did that. Thank you. Today, because of the weather, we've chosen to cancel our pet blessing. If you would like to come and stand in our garden in the cold rain, you're welcome to do that. We will not be there. This Tuesday, we are packing backpacks for children who are hungry and in need at Feeding South Dakota. We were a bit negligent in, um, in advertising this. It is this Tuesday at noon. If you are available, the sign up board is out. I ask that you put your name down so that we can have a, a clear count of how many people to expect. So uh, please make yourselves available if you're able and join us uh, to pack backpacks for hungry children throughout our area. Today began the civil discourse conversation that Ken and David Seeger is putting, has put together for us. He spent a lot of time and energy putting this course together. It is a course that comes from the National Episcopal Church. Uh, there were 40 people at this morning's session who want to learn more about how we can dialogue with one another in charity and in hospitality without trying to yell each other down. Um, we cannot expect things to change, whether it's in Washington or Pierre or over at the public administration building or even in our own families. We cannot expect things to change until we make the conscious effort that we are going to change the, the, the direction of civil discourse in our country, in our families, and in our communities. If you missed this morning, please make time to come the next several weeks and be with us as we expand our vocabulary and our understanding of how we might speak with love to one another and with one another. We have our UTO gathering, in-gathering box, our basket today. If you brought your UTO boxes, simply drop them as you come up for communion later. Um, I was, uh, there was a request before the eight o'clock service and I won't name names, but uh, the suggestion was, oh, I forgot my UTO box. Maybe we can bring them up at communion so nobody will notice that I didn't put mine in. And I said, fair enough. So if you'll bring yours up at, uh, at communion, I'm be most uh, grateful. The, this year's UTO offering, United Think offering, will go to support the Episcopal Church's hospital in Gaza. Finally, I wanted to uh, make you all aware that uh, Stuart Flannery, who has been on staff for a year and a half, actually coming close to two years now as our Director of Communications and Youth, um, he is ready to launch into a new career path. He and I had a conversation recently and, well, the career path at Emmanuel is a little short because his next station after where he is would be my job. <laughs> And I said, well, I don't know if you're ready for that one yet, Stuart. I'm not ready to give this one up just yet. So uh, Stuart has been such a blessing to us and to our youth group, and I'm very thankful for him. Um, we wish him well. He was at the 8 o'clock service, and we were able to wish him well, send him forth with our blessings and our love, um, as he, as a young man should, seeks out a career path that um, has great longevity and uh, great excitement. He's quite excited. I'm excited for him. And so so we, uh, we thank Stuart and send him again with our blessings. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good your vows to the Most High.
like a special blessing, birthday, anniversary, or travel, you may come forward, please, at this time. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for these gifts which we now return unto you. Bless them and make them holy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> I already knew that. <laughs> Why don't you guys hold hands? I do hope you have a wonderful journey and a safe return home. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel, surround them with your loving care, protect them from every danger, and bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Have fun. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send your spirit of peace and comfort upon your daughter Kristen as she lifts up prayers for her father as he continues to heal and to recuperate. We ask, O oh Lord, that your mighty hand be speedy in healing him and that your hand continue to comfort, guide, and protect Kristen all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Lord, wash away my iniquities, cleanse me of my sins. We continue in our Red Book of Common Prayer on page 361. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. tradition to kneel. However, you're welcome to remain standing or be seated according to your comfort or ability. <clears throat> Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ.
redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The sign out front that says the Episcopal Church welcomes you includes your receiving Holy Eucharist with us today. Regardless of denomination, all baptized Christians are welcome to receive Holy Eucharist. We do have gluten-free hosts available. If that is part of your need, please let me know when I get to you.
Our post-communion prayer can be found on page 365, page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Thank you.